Father, as we come before you today, we open up your holy, infallible, inerrant word. We pray today, dear God, that your word produces fruit for the kingdom of God. As you promised, that your word would not return void, but it would accomplish that for which you sent it. And in that we trust, and that blessing we claim, in Jesus' holy name, amen. Thank you. you. may be seated this morning. What a wonderful time of year it is, getting ready for Christmas and getting, uh, getting all uh, excited about Thanksgiving that's coming up. Thanksgiving's my favorite holiday. I uh, don't have to shop, and I get to eat all I want, so praise the Lord for Thanksgiving. This morning, if you have your Bibles, you want to look up the Scripture text, I want to speak to you from one verse in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter number 10 and verse 23. We've been studying through the book of Hebrews on Wednesday night, and we covered this extensively uh, in our Wednesday night study, and uh, if you're interested in that, I can give you the notes and things, or you can come and participate any time. And as I was studying this passage, I got stuck on this verse, and since we're doing a series of messages on the attributes of God, uh, a couple of weeks ago I preached from John 3.16 and talked about the love of God, and last week I talked about the grace of God. Today I want to speak to you on the faithfulness of the Lord, the faithfulness of the Lord. Hebrews 10 verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Faithfulness of the Lord. Though he was a veteran of 21 seasons, in only one did he win more than 20 games. He never pitched a non-hitter, and only once did he lead the league in any category. Yet on June 21st, 1986, Don Sutton rubbed pitching elbows with the true legends of baseball by becoming the 13th pitcher to win 300 games. His analysis of his success is worth noting. Quote, a grinder and a mechanic is what he calls himself. A grinder and a mechanic. I never considered myself flamboyant or exceptional, but all my life I found a way to get the job done. And get the job done he did through two decades, six presidential terms, and four trades. He consistently did what pitchers are supposed to do, win games. With tunnel vision devotion, he spent 21 seasons redefining greatness. He's been nicknamed the family sedan of baseball pitchers. The family sedan. And I, I like that illustration because there's nothing frills. There's no frills about this guy. He just kept his head down and just kept right on going. He's like the ever-ready bunny, you know, just kept right on going. And, you know, I love to be around people that are fired up. Don't you like to get around people that are just passionate, especially about Jesus? And uh, sometimes you get around people, and they've been to a conference, or they've been to a seminar, or maybe they're a brand-new believer, and they're just so excited they're going to set out and just change the world. And, you know, if, you, uh, if I had a choice between passionate and apathetic, I'd choose passionate. If I had the choice between somebody zealous and somebody indifferent, I'll choose the zealous any day. But the problem is we can't live on a high all the time. The problem is uh, getting fired up like that sometimes is like a sugar high. It lasts only a while, then you get back to normal life. And so this morning I want to speak to you about how to remain faithful in normal life, or how to remain faithful in the daily grind. And uh, God never called any of us to be superstars. Uh, and that's good for me anyway. God never called any of us to be celebrity Christians or to get noticed or to get our name published in uh, magazines or be on television interviewed for our Christian faith. Instead, we are called to imitate the Lord Jesus 
We're called to humbly serve others. And you might say we have been called to be the family sedan of Christianity. That's what we are. Just keep our head down and keep on plugging. And so how can you stay faithful? The Bible tells us to be faithful. It says be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And so we want to know how to do that. And the central truth this morning is we can have faith in God because God is faithful. We can have faith in God because God is faithful. And I want to kind of flesh that out a little bit. The first thing I want you to notice is we're commanded to be faithful. The text says, let us, uh, uh, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, without wavering. So what is wavering? Wavering is the opposite of faithful. It's the opposite. Wavering means that you are in an unfixed, unstable position. It means that we're uncertain where we stand. There are various words and phrases that we use as synonyms to describe wavering, such as waffling. You know, he's a waffler. Uh, it's been through this political season. Everybody's looking for the candidate that flip-flops on his previous position. Uh, we call that hot one minute and cold the next. Another way of saying it is uh, that, that the person who wavers is a person who lacks solid convictions. They don't have solid convictions. You know, convictions are those things that we firmly hold to which we refuse to compromise. Convictions are those things that we live by. They're a set of solid things that we live by. Uh, for example, do you have convictions about marriage? Most of you do. Do you have convictions about family? Well, most of us do. Do you have convictions about church? Most of us do. Do you have convictions about uh, things that are important in life? And from time to time, we ought to examine our convictions. Do the convictions I hold, uh, are, they, are they biblical? We should, uh, we should examine our convictions because what convictions are is convictions predetermine a course of action before we're faced with the circumstance. So in other words, we, we decide beforehand what we're going to do and how we're going to behave when we are faced with certain circumstances. Now, what happens is when we have a conviction or we have a predetermined set of actions that we claim that we're going to do, and then we are faced with that situation, if we waver, if we uh, compromise on our convictions, then we didn't really have a conviction. What we had then was a preference. See, we preferred to do this, but when the heat is on, we waffled, we wavered, we, we teeter-tottered back and forth. And so what we need is, is we need to have solid convictions. I want to just read you what I think is very comical little speech. Uh, and, and this is the example that I always point to when I point to an example of somebody who wavers, somebody who waffles, somebody who flip-flops. And, of course, it comes from a politician. And his name, his name is Noah Soggy Sweat, believe it or not. And he was a uh, Mississippi congressman in 1952. He gave this speech on the floor of Congress uh, as to whether or not to end prohibition. And so this was his speech. And he stood up and he said, my friends, I had not intended to discuss this controversial subject at this particular time. However, I want you to know that I do not shun controversy. On the contrary, I'll take a stand on any issue at any time, regardless of how fraught with controversy it might be. And you've asked me how I feel about whiskey. All right, here's how I feel about whiskey. If when you say whiskey, you mean the devil's brew, 
The poison scourge, the bloody monster that defiles innocence, dethrones reason, destroys the home, creates misery and poverty, yea, literally takes the bread from the mouths of little children. If you mean the evil drink that topples the Christian man and woman from the pinnacle of righteousness, gracious living into the bottomless pit of degradation and despair and shame and helplessness and hopelessness, then I'm certainly against it. But if when you say whiskey, you mean the oil of conversation, the philosophic wine, the ale that is consumed when good fellows get together, that puts a song in their heart and laughter on their lips and the warm glow of contentment in their eyes. If you mean Christmas cheer, if you mean the stimulating drink that puts the spring in the old gentleman's step on a frosty, crispy morn, if you mean the drink that enables a man to magnify his joy and his happiness and to forget, if only for a little while, life's great tragedies and heartaches and sorrows, if you mean that drink, the sale of which pours into our treasuries untold millions of dollars, which are used to provide tender care for our little crippled children, our blind, our deaf, our dumb, our pitiful, aged, and infirm, to build highways and hospitals and schools, then I'm certainly for it. That is my stand, and I will not waver. Isn't that the way we are sometimes? <laughs> we just can't get aside and get on it. And it illustrates how sometimes we like to straddle the fence and we want to have it both ways. However, Christians are to stand on godly convictions. And the text tells us one thing, and that is Christians are to not waver on Jesus Christ. Notice he says, don't waver about Christ. In verse 23 of the text, it says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. The confession of our hope means our Christian life. It means Jesus Christ. In the book of Hebrews, the writer is trying to move the individuals uh, that he's writing to in their Christian community. He's trying to move them beyond the Old Testament into the New Testament. He's trying to get them to abandon uh, animal sacrifices in favor of Christ the final sacrifice. He's trying to get them to do away with temple rituals and to trust only in Jesus. He's trying to get them to do away with the old priesthood because Jesus, our high priest, has paid it all for our sins. He's trying to get them to solidly stand on the conviction that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And some of the readers had initially accepted the gospel and received Christ, but because of the peer pressure from the synagogue rulers, they were waffling. They were considering going back on Christ and going back into their old way of life. They're wavering and uh, they're not sure where they stand. Their confession is that confession that Jesus is the Messiah. And it's that confession that gives us hope. Christ gives us hope. Now remember in the Bible, hope is not wishful thinking. Hope is a certainty because of God's promise. And so they were wavering in their commitment to Christ. And the writer of Hebrews wants them to stop it. Stop wavering. Now, there's a fair amount of wavering that takes place amongst us sometimes. Some things are so crystal clear in the Scripture that we dare not straddle a fence over. For example, the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. That's, uh, that's unalterable. It's, it's not a position we can uh, negotiate with. I'll give you another one that Christians are all over the place on. The sanctity of human life. That is non-negotiable. It's not up to us to decide who can live and who can die. I'll give you another one. God, in His holy, infallible, inerrant Word, defines what a marriage is. And we don't get to redefine it. It's not our privilege to do so. And many of these things are not up for debate. We don't get to decide on God's Word whether it's right or not. God's Word is always right. 
Amen. And what we need is, is we need to have biblical convictions on biblical issues and get away from just having personal preferences on these important issues. In the case of the Hebrews, the writer's telling them to stand firm. Don't compromise on this confession because this confession that Jesus is your Messiah or Jesus is the Christ, that is your hope. Within the Christian community, there is room in a spirit of love and mutual respect. There is room for debate on certain secondary issues. That's always been the case. For example, Christians debate on the rapture of the church, whether it's going to be before the tribulation, mid-tribulation, end of tribulation. Some Christians don't believe in the rapture. And that don't mean they're not saved. It just means people got different opinions on that. We can discuss that, and that's okay. Sometimes people want to discuss Calvin's tulip. Well, you know, I prefer daisies myself. But nonetheless, uh, uh, there's room for debate on those things. But when it comes down to what Jesus said, when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me, there is no room for debate. Jesus asked Peter, who do people say I am? Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus told Peter that it's on that confession that I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now in this age of uncertainty in which we find ourselves, we live in an age where people no longer believe that they were created as a special act of God. We have a generation of people that are taught that they're just souped up apes. That's what they are. They fell out of a tree and got lucky enough to walk upright. In this age where syncretism and coexist and all religions are said to be the same. In this age where sin is applauded and righteousness is eschewed. And and in this confused generation where, where people don't even know what gender they are. In this crazy age in which we find ourselves, people are looking for solid ground to stand on, and what they need to see is they need to see a unified church, a loving body of Christ, who says, upon this rock I'll stand, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Hallelujah. We need to be a sure voice to this dark age. And he says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. This is not a time to be uncertain. And I'll just pause for a moment and ask you, are you certain? If the world ended today, if the church was raptured, or for some unforeseen reason you left this world and you stood before God Almighty this morning, is there certainty in your heart that you know that you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Because the Bible says that whosoever shall come, he, uh, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it's as easy as calling on the name of the Lord and trusting him to forgive you of your sins. And if you've not done that today, won't you be certain today? Won't you confess that and have that hope in your heart this morning? Second thing I want you to see is our God is faithful. Our God is faithful. As I was preparing this message, I thought to myself, why can we be faithful? Steve, why can you be faithful? Why can we trust God? Well, the answer is very simple. We can trust God because God is faithful. That's what the text says. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So we can remain faithful and not waver because God is faithful. You know, the scripture says in Hebrews 6.18 that God cannot lie. It's impossible for God to lie. Now, I'm going to ask you this. When is the last time you heard a, 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 a news alert or you saw a headline or you got an angel come to you or some other way and just confirm to you, you know, God made a mistake. Or how about this? God said something and it didn't happen. 
When's the last time anybody told you that? It don't happen. You don't hear that. Uh, how about this? Was you ever praying about a problem? You got down on your knees before God and you said, God, I just don't know what to do. And the answer came to you and God said, well, I'm sorry, but I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> Caught me totally off guard and I don't know what to do about it either. You see, God is faithful. God is dependable. You can depend on his word and we can depend on his son because his son died on the cross and rose from the dead just like he said he would. I once knew a preacher who had lost his faith. He no longer served God and, and, and somehow or another the enemy had got in his mind and convinced him that God didn't really care about him. He had just lost his faith. And one night in a drunken stupor, he was involved in a car accident that nearly killed him. And I went to see him the next morning, and he, he had a horrible gash all the way across his forehead where his head went into the windshield of the car. And I asked him with his wife and his daughter sitting in the living room with us, I said, what would you say this morning if I was putting you in a hole in the ground? What, 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 what would I say to your wife and your family this morning if I was lowering you in a casket? I'll never forget what he said to me. That poor, pitiful man said, Steve, you're not saying anything to me that I haven't said to other people a thousand times. And the problem was, he had become unfaithful because he thought God had become unfaithful. And you see, I'm here to tell you this morning, I don't care what's going on in your life. I don't care what dark clouds are on the horizon. I don't care what CNN says. I don't care what Fox says. I don't care what the polls say. I don't care what anybody else says. God is on the throne. Hallelujah. God's on the throne. And one of the main reasons for believers uh, to trust in him is because he will never fail us. Listen to what the Bible says. We need not falter in temptation because God is faithful. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as co is common to man, and God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation, he will provide the way of escape so that you'll be able to endure it. God's faithful. God is faithful, so we don't need to fear the devil. Listen to this. 2 Thessalonians 3.3 3 says, But the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen and protect you and keep you from the evil one. God is faithful. We need not fall and continuously stay in a state of sin because God is faithful. 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, that pastor I just talked about, he forgot. He forgot that sin may be a temporary activity for a believer, but it need not be a permanent state. Now, we all fall into temptation. God's provided a way of escape, but we may miss that way of escape. We may not pay attention. And then we may get under the oppression of the devil, but we need not stay there because God will protect us from that. And even if we go that far, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all sin. So listen, our past need not define our future. You can draw a period. You can draw a line in the sand and say, devil, I've gone this far with you, but from now on I'm going with Jesus because God is faithful. Think about it for a moment. Moses messed up. God told him to speak to the rock. What did he do? He smote the rock. But God still let him see the promised land. King David slew a giant, and then David committed adultery and had a man killed. Now, that's bad. That's bad. But afterwards, David wrote Psalm 51, which most of us have read many times. Peter, I like Peter. The reason I like Peter is because I'm kind of like Peter. 
Peter got out on the water, and he took a stroll walking across that water. <laughs> now, that's good, right? Amen? Right. But then he began to falter. He began to waver, and he began to sink. And Jesus just stood there and said, well, you sorry thing? Just go ahead and sink. No. The Lord Jesus reached down and got him by the arm and pulled him back up. Why? Because God is faithful. God is faithful. I've spoken to a woman one time who confessed a horrible moral failure. Just terrible thing. And she said, Pastor, that happened and I did it before I was a Christian. But she said, I still feel guilty about it. Is there any verse in the Bible that can help me? And I didn't really know what to say at that point. And the Holy Spirit just gave me. And I opened up my Bible, 1 John 1, 9, the verse I just read to you. And I said, the Word of God here says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I said, did you confess it? She said, I confessed it. I said, then it's gone. And the only person that keeps bringing it up is you. Why can we rest in the fact that our sins are forgiven? Because God is faithful. And even, think of this. God is faithful so that even if we become unfaithful, He can allow us to become faithful again. Let me say that again. God is faithful so that even if we become unfaithful, we can become faithful again. Listen to this verse. You might want to meditate on this. 2 Timothy 2.13. If we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. Even if we become faithless, God is still faithful. And because God is still faithful, we can become faithful again. Hallelujah. I like it. I don't know if y'all do or not, but praise God. And then finally, I want you to see the last thing. Our faithful God makes promises. He says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Now, the writer is trying to assure the wavering Hebrews that they are secure in God who is faithful. Somebody needs to hear that last point. God promises. God who cannot lie has promised. God who is faithful has promised. And God is able to carry out his promises because God is sovereign. Sovereign means that God rules. It means he rules the universe. And I like the idea that God rules, and I'm going to tell you something, because he is sovereign and he always rules, sometimes he overrules. You say, what does that mean? Well, there was a king named Nebuchadnezzar. In the book of Daniel, he made an image. It was a, it was a very, uh, uh, very impressive image, big gold image, statue. I tend to believe it looked like him. He made an image and he made, a, he made a command to all the kingdom that anybody in any province, when they see the image and they hear the music play, everybody in the kingdom has to bow down and pay homage to that image. And old King Nebuchadnezzar, he was the civic ruler of the land. He was the king. He was the monarch. He was the government. He spoke and it was done. He considered himself to rule. But there were three Hebrew boys, and their name was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they said, We're not going to rule. We're not going we're not going to bow down to the king's image. We're not going to bow down to the king's image. And the earthly king thought he was in charge, but what he did not know, 
that they knew was that the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the same God who parted the Red Sea and slew the entire Egyptian army, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is sovereign and what one man can, can, can rule, God can overrule. And, and so Daniel 3, verse 17, uh, the king says, all right, you boys, you're not going to worship my image. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to throw you in the fire. I'm going to put you in a furnace and see what you do. You want to know how they answered? Okay, we'll bow down. No, that's not what they said. They said, if it be so, in other words, you're going to throw us in the fire. Go ahead. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able. He is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. And this is what really made the king mad. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, we're not going to serve your gods or worship your golden image that you have set up. Now, y'all know what happened, right? Y'all know what happened. He threw them three boys in the fire. It was so hot, he, he stoked it up seven more times. It got so hot that the guys that was escorting them fell dead before they got there. And I find it ironic that they didn't turn around and run off. But they didn't. They just marched on in there. And, and, and when the king looked in there, them three guys was in there, but then there was somebody else in there with them. And they were walking around. Somebody said they was walking around to keep from freezing to death. <laughs> Hallelujah. The king looked in there and he said, it looks like the son of God's in there with them. You see, the king thought he ruled, but our sovereign God overruled. Hallelujah. Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve committed sin. And their sin tainted the soul of all, all their offspring. The death angel has haunted every son of Adam ever since then. After Adam was expelled from the Garden of Eden, the dominant phrase in the book of Genesis was, and he died. Every human being along with all nature, trees, animals, and the planet has been subjected to death. The scripture says in Romans 5, 17, by the transgression of one man, death reigned. That means that from Adam all the way up to the Lord Jesus Christ, death ruled. And even the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, died on an old rugged cross for my sins and for yours. But even though death ruled, our sovereign God overruled death. Praise God. And so when Jesus come up out of the grave, the scripture says, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? Hallelujah, up from the grave, he arose with a mighty triumph for his foe. Praise God. We got a God who's coming again. And I'm here to tell you, you can depend on it. And beloved, it is because God is faithful that you and I can therefore be faithful. Because he can't lie, because his will will be done. We can depend on him. We can follow him. We can trust him. We can believe in him. And our sovereign God who always rules, and when he needs to or when he chooses, he overrules. He promised and he is faithful. I, I could stand here all day and read you verses about what God's promised you. Listen to this, James 2, 5. Listen, my beloved brethren, did God... Did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and, listen, heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? I live in a little old log house built in 1974 out in the ranch club. I don't know what I'm going to do when I get in a kingdom. I know one thing, I'm going to be glad to not have to fix nothing. Praise God. He's promised you a crown of life. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So now he's promised you a kingdom, and he's promised you a crown. Listen to this. Revelation 1.6 says, He has made us to be a kingdom 
priest to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And if that weren't enough, this God of ours who sovereignly rules and he reigns and when he desires, he overrules, he has promised you this. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I want you to hear what he said. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 and 6. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, here's your promise. I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Did you see that? We can be faithful because he is faithful. So this morning I would just say, are you afraid of dying? He promises that whosoever believes in him shall have everlasting life. Are you afraid of suffering loss? Oh, you watch the news and the stock market's down, the economy's crashing, we're losing everything we've got. It makes me sad. But you know what King David said? King David says, I've been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging for bread. Hallelujah, we got a good God. Do you fear the future? I'm here to tell you, you know they say there's, since COVID has started, uh, suicide rate between 20 and 30 years old has skyrocketed because they figure there's no reason to live. I mean, they're told the planet's melting right before their eyes and the world is just a place that is it's just awful. You don't need to fear the future. And here's why. I don't know what will come tomorrow, but I do know who holds tomorrow. He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last and the beginning and the end. <laughs> you just don't get no better than that. What would you think this morning? If you headed up to Prince Frederick, and there you see a hitchhiker. Y'all do know what that is, right? I mean, when I was a kid, people hitchhiked everywhere. You don't hardly ever see them anymore. But a hitchhiker is a guy who puts his thumb out and hopes somebody picks him up. So you leave church, you're headed to Prince Frederick. You, you see a hitchhiker, but normally you see a hitchhiker on one side of the road or the other, and his thumb is pointing in the direction he wants to go. But this hitchhiker is rather unique. He's not on one side of the road. He's not on the other. He's in the median. And he's standing there going this. He's about as confused as a termite in a wooden yo-yo. He don't know what to do with himself. You see, the point I'm trying to make is you got to go in one direction or the other. You got to pick a side and get on it. You better decide whether you're on God's side or you're not. You can't be straddling the fence. You got to pick. I'm going to go to heaven or I'm going to go to hell. I'm going to follow Jesus or I'm going to stay in the world. You, you, can't, you can't stand with both thumbs out hoping to go in two directions at the same time. And you can trust in God because he is faithful. And because he is faithful, you can trust in God. And so let me ask you, has 2020 been a roller coaster of a year or what? I saw a picture of a kid sliding down a cheese grater, you know, and he said, if 2020 was a, I don't know. <laughs> but one thing I do know, it's, it's, been, it's been difficult to maintain your balance. And here's one of the things we're watching happen right now. We're watching this happen. All the foundations are being shaken. All the foundations, politically, even the foundation that many churches are built on, it's being shaken. How are we going to do church? How are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? School, work, everything, everything that we're depending on is shaky, shaky, shaky. But beloved, 
Our God is a solid rock. Have faith in God. He's on his throne. Have faith in God. He watches o'er his own. He cannot fail. He must prevail. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Would you stand with me this morning? Bow your head and close your eyes. The central truth of this message is we can have faith in God because God is faithful. Maybe this morning you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. Maybe you're watching online. And this morning, that's exactly what you want to do. You want to, you want to put your faith in God who cannot lie. Put your soul in his hands. Rest your eternal security in the faithfulness of God. You will never regret that decision. And, and it begins by simply asking him to forgive you of your sins, to come into your life and be your Savior and Lord. And maybe this morning you are... Uh, have another decision you want to make. Uh, you want to come to this altar and seal that decision before God. Maybe you want to come back and ask God to forgive you of your sins. You've strayed. Or maybe it's your desire to join Southern Calvert Baptist Church and be a member and help us share the good news of the Lord Jesus around the world. Whatever your decision is, I pray, as soon as I get through saying amen, that you make that decision. And if you need to come, Father, in Jesus' name I pray today. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your sovereignty. Thank you for your grace. And God, I just pray that for any decisions that you would have made today, that they'll be made for the glory of God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.